Whenever I go to a new place where I am not known and I meet a group of people, they ask me two questions. And the first is, Father, what is your name? And so I tell them my name. And the second question which inevitably follows is, where are you from? And with my thumb, I point to the skies. And they will say to me, condescendingly possibly, yes, Father, we know all of us are from heaven, but where are you from? And I keep pointing with my thumb to the skies. And I look at them in such a manner that they stop asking me the question. And you might say, but why don't you want to tell people where are you from? Because of what you will read in the gospel text of today, Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. Jesus until chapter 6, has been shown as a man who is powerful in word and in deed. As a matter of fact, right at the beginning of the gospel in Mark 1, 21 and 22, we are told about the teaching of Jesus. He taught with authority and not as the religious leaders of his time. His was a special authority when he taught. We are also given a Jesus who heals first an exorcist or an exorcism is performed and Jesus heals a person possessed by a demon. He then is able to cleanse a leper, heals a paralytic let down from the roof, he is a person with a withered arm and he tells these three wonderful and earth groundbreaking parables, the parable of the sower and the seed, the parable of the seed growing secretly and the parable of the mustard seed in which he communicates the depth of his understanding about God. Immediately after the parables are told, he is able to calm the forces of nature with a word. He is able to calm the storm. And then he exercises the jealousy and demoniac in chapter 5, which no one so far could do. And the jealousy and demoniac was given up as a lost cause. And Jesus cures the man and restores him to his family and to his community and then he heals a woman with a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all of her money on doctors and now is cured simply by touching the Lord and he raises Jairus's daughter from the dead in chapter 5. This is the Jesus who goes to his hometown. He possibly went to his hometown in order to be with his family. But the moment he enters into his village, those of his village use this phrase about him, we know. Jesus is hardly entered. When they look at him and they say, this man we know. What do they know? They know about Jesus. It's not this they say. It's not this the carpenter. So they tell us about the trade of Jesus, which is not a problem at all. It's not this the carpenter. It's not his mother called Mary. Usually a man was known because of the father, was called the son of his father. So while it is likely that the foster father of Jesus, Joseph, may have been dead, and that is why Jesus is called the son of Mary, it seems from the context that this title son of Mary here is an abuse of Jesus. 
because they were possibly seeing, we know who his mother is, but we don't know who his father is. This is possibly why they call Jesus son of Mary here, because of the next verse that follows in which we are told, and they took offense at him. And so the question is, why did they take offense at Jesus? Why did the people of his own hometown get upset with him and think that he had offended them? Why were they offended with him? And the answer is very simple. The answer is that they were saying to Jesus that he was from this remote village of Nazareth and anyone who was from the remote village of Nazareth could not go to this great height to which Jesus had gone. They were saying to Jesus that those of that village were chickens and were meant to pluck seed from the ground. They were not meant to be eagles who would fly high into the sky. Could not accept that someone from their village had reached such great heights, had become so popular, was able to do so much for so many. They were not able to encounter a person who could speak eloquently about God's love, who could manifest that love which God has shown by making people whole. And that is why we took offense. Mark then goes on to add a very devastating sentence when he says, and Jesus could do no mighty work there. My translation of this verse is that the people of his hometown made Jesus impotent. The people of his hometown made Jesus unable to perform. This is the reason why I don't like to tell people where I am from. Because there is the danger and the grave danger of stereotyping me, of labeling me, of being biased for or against me. What really does it matter where I am from? What really does it matter what the color of my skin is, what the color of my hair is, how my nose is positioned, or how my eyes are, and what color my irises are? It does not matter. What matters is that we are in this world together as brothers and as sisters, and that is how I will look at every single individual rather than as from a particular place or from a particular community or from a particular religion. Today, we have become so, so parochial that even in a nation, we are divided by states. The division of states is largely for administration. It's largely that when something is smaller, it is easier to administer. It is not to separate the nation, whether it is the United States of America, whether it is the states of India, whether it is the states of any other country. We are focusing too much on division, on separation, on parochialism, and not enough on unity. We have been divided into countries also, not from the point of view of division, because of division, not because we want to separate ourselves from each other, but we have been divided into nations only for the purposes of administration. But now, 
we have taken our division so so seriously that we cannot accept another even though he or she is a human being because of the color of his or her skin because of the manner in which he or she worships god because of the language which he or she speaks because of the food which he or she eats and because of the place in which he or she sleeps We call ourselves a global village. But unfortunately, we have never been more separated than we are now. And the coronavirus has taught us a number of lessons. But as far as I am concerned, the most important lesson it has taught me is the lesson of interconnectedness that you and I that people all over the world are interconnected a sneeze can infect you my cough can alarm you my touch can infect you and make you sick this is how interconnected we are we are not only interconnected with each other but we are also interconnected with nature, the environment. And this is the lesson which we must learn. So our focus has to be unity. Our focus has to be universalism rather than parochialism or being restricted and separate. Jesus was not accepted because he had flown so high. And because they did not accept him, he was made impotent. When we label people, when we stereotype them, because of the externals that we see, then we are doing them and ourselves a disservice. Can I look at an individual as a brother or a sister? A holy man was once asked, Rabbi, when does night end and day begin? Is it when we see the first rays of the sun? Is it when the cock crows for the first time or the second time? Is it when we are able to see into the distance? And the Rabbi replied, Night ends and day begins. When you look at a man and see in him your brother, and at a woman and see in her your sister, then night is ended and day has begun. Let us even as we are challenged in this time when we are being so separated from each other, focus on unity, on oneness, on interconnectedness and on the universal 